Welcome to the Integral Stage Sexuality Series. I'm Layman Pascal, and before I host my high-priced week-long workshop on integrative sexuality at a seaside Caribbean resort, I need to make sure I've been fully exposed to the multidimensional richness and profundity of this topic. A topic that most people find deeply physically compelling, emotionally significant, and for some people intellectually fascinating and brimming with spiritual and developmental potential. Here to share the ins and out of their understanding is... Hi, everybody. 54. This is Layman Pascal, the green grocer of meta theory and regenerative community here on the integral stage with another episode of our long running and occasionally sauntering sexuality and gender series. Now, I'm known for wild hyper linguistic introductions that stray peculiarly into the twilight zone between humanity's basic ontological categories, but not today. Today, we're talking with Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers whose work brings together themes of spiritual intimacy, shame, healing, parenting, and social justice. Do a lot of people just call you Dr. Tina? Yeah, they do. <laughs> and where where are you in the world right now? Where's I'm your, in Seattle. Wa location? I'm in Seattle, Washington, which is why sunshine's important. <laughs> yeah, I grew up on the West Coast. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay, yeah. yep. That's where I've spent oh, most else. of my time too. Where are you a now? Lot of people, I'm in uh, Thunder Bay, Ontario. So I grew up in like BC West Coast and moved yeah. across here a few years ago. Gotcha. Okay. So you know but, BC. Uh, I know <laughs> BC, and we get a lot of sun here, but then we get a lot of snow. <laughs> yeah. Is it snow time already? Uh any day now. It's sort okay. of it's on the edge. <laughs> you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I saw in your uh, professional propaganda materials, you were referred to as a media personality. And I was curious, how does Tina, the media personality, relate to your private self? Or what's it like to be a media personality? What does that mean to you? Yeah. Anyway, what does that mean? That's a really good question. I, I just end up on a lot of media. And I think it's because I talk about sexuality and intimacy connection and pleasure in ways that are uncommon in North America. Um, and I'm really comfortable with it. And so, um, so that just ends up kind of tossing me around like a ping pong ball all over the place, you know, um, how it compares to my personal life is there's not a lot of difference between who I am anywhere. And um, so what people get when I'm in public, when I'm more public facing, it's really not that much different unless I'm really cranky with my husband. And then then I probably look a little bit more edgier. But otherwise, I'm pretty consistent. And mostly because I don't think I have the brain space to hold multiple personalities well. Right. <laughs> so. it's, a, it's a beautiful sweet spot where integrity and laziness come together. Oh, so true. <laughs> so true. Yeah, that that's my sweet spot. Yep. Uh, my curiosity is around like this, like everybody experiences sexuality and intimacy, but not everybody gets intellectually curious about it enough to think about it and devote their life to it. How does that come about for you? How do you get into it as a topic? Yeah, great question. I didn't set out to do that. Um, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I taught in an academic setting, graduate marriage and family therapist for almost 30 years. I ran a medical family therapy program, which means I looked at the impact of illness and our healthcare system on people's lives and then worked with physicians around how to make that better and all kinds of things around that. But I had been teaching all along the human sexuality course, which is a required course for licensure for marriage and family therapists. And, and I had grown up in an odd family. I had grown up in a Swedish immigrant home in the States, but my, all my relatives were very comfortable around bodies and sexuality. And that comes from the history over in, in Northern Europe, you know, where they've been teaching comprehensive sex ed since the early forties. So I didn't realize my family was weird until somewhere in my 30s. 
But I was just always talking, comfortable talking about it because my family had been. And I learned about it in little, what I call sound bites, you know, all the way through my growing up. So when I was teaching this class in around the year 2000, I started teaching it in the early 90s. And around the year 2000, I started noticing this dramatic increase in how much the students hated themselves <clears throat> or thought of themselves as perverted when they were describing really normal developmental processes, you know, that just, you know, common, you know, people commonly go through, you know, they have these curiosities at two and these curiosities at five and these curiosities at 10. So they're describing same stories I had been hearing, but the way they felt about themselves was dramatically um, just dark. And I didn't understand what was happening at first, but it literally broke my heart because I thought, oh, my babe, you, you deserve to feel like you're amazing, you know, and they were just describing horrible things and, about themselves. And so I did a, like more research. I was talking to them, like, tell me more about your growing up, you know. And what I came to realize is I was hitting the first wave of students that had gotten abstinence only education in the U.S. And some of those, a good number of them, had been involved in conservative religious settings as well. So what we now call purity movement. And I didn't realize it at all at the time, but there was a merging of church and state in the United States where we started teaching religious, quote unquote, sexual education through the abstinence only program in the 80s. And it started to really peak, kind of hit a crest in the mid 90s. And I was just seeing the impact of that, this rise in what I later came to call religious sexual shame and sexual trauma that we had not been talking about before. And I thought, I don't think anybody has a clue what we're doing to people. We're, I've got students and clients that have symptoms of childhood sexual abuse, and they have not been abused in the traditional sense. We've got to do something about this. So I just started writing about it, talking about it, researching it, trying to understand it, went on to get a PhD in clinical sexology. And it's just, it's kind of become my life as I've come to understand what's happened in the United States, in particular, sociopolitically, and then how that has shaped people's lives in profound ways. So sexual shame, I can read you a, a definition of it because we finally got one in 2017, but it causes people to feel tremendous humiliation and disgust about themselves and their identity as a person, as a sexual person, as a loving person. And it, it permeates their life. So then it affects how they do connection and pleasure and intimacy and attachment in their life, which really is the core of where we find our happiness. It's not so much in all the stuff we buy that makes us comfortable, but it does not make us happy. What makes us happy is the quality of our relationships, our ability to give and receive love. And so, yeah, it ended up becoming my mission really to help people understand how uniquely wonderfully they are made and to love and to give love and to receive love is a joy and they deserve to do it. And if they're struggling to do it, let's figure out why, you know, because in the United States, we likely hurt you without meaning to. I like the way that you described the sort of ambient sound bites around sexuality as you were growing up. Uh, I've got a Finnish partner. We've got some kids in the house. They seem to me pretty good at self-regulating. You know, there's a certain phase where they are like not looking at things on a screen and then a phase where they become curious. But I'm always curious about when and where and how and what the strategies are to introduce conversation with them because yeah. you don't want to do something too soon that it's a little bit traumatic you don't want to do something late when you've missed the window you don't necessarily want to have a house where everything's discussed all the time we certainly don't want a house where certain things never get discussed how do you get those balances right what's what's your take on when and how parents should provide sexual conversation and perspectives in the house so they can be yeah. like the best ally to their kids <laughs> yeah, boy, that's such a great question. And and you're right, because it is about becoming an ally to your child. And if you can become an ally to your child around relationship development, sexual development, intimacy, you know, those kinds of really tender topics, 
then they're going to trust you with a whole lot more. And we have research to back that up, that kids who say their parents talk to them about sexuality and relationships and some of the hard topics that they felt closer to them overall through their adolescence. So it's really what I think people want. Um, I, I wrote a book in, uh, it was published in 2017 called Sex, God, and the Conservative Church, Erasing Shame from Sexual Intimacy, where I explained the arc of what had happened, how America became sex negative, the role ca um, capitalism has played in that, how you heal, so how it manifests and how you heal and all of that. And I started hearing from people all over saying, that was super helpful. I feel like I'm beginning to liberate myself from some of those ideas that I bought into. I have kids in my life, either nieces, nephews, children, whatever. I know I don't want to do to them what was done to me, but I don't know what to do. So basically your same question, what do I do? When do I do it? You know, and, and what are all the topics that kind of go into it? So I wrote a book that came out a few years ago and I updated every two years and it's called Shameless Parenting, Everything You Need to Raise Shame-Free Confident Kids and Heal Your Shame Too. And I put it together in such a way to actually hold the hands of parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whatever. Um, and I divided it birth to two, two to four, four to six, six to eight, all the way up to 18, because there's actually different conversations you're wanting to have with your kids all the time. And we can learn this. I mean, really, it's about following them and listening to them and watching them, right? So the year old child is realizing that their hand belongs to them, that they can reach out and grab things. And it's somewhere around a year that they're getting their diapers changed or they're in the tub and they discover their genitals. And this is a glorious day for them, right? Because we have all these wonderful nerve endings there. If a parent understands that's just another part of the body and or they've dealt with their own shame around that, when you have shame, you do things like, oh, I don't know what to do, right? And you kind of freeze, right? But if you've kind of dealt with that and you're like, eh, it's just another body part, then you're like, hey, dude, that's your penis. It's a wonderful part of your body. Or that's your vulva. That's a wonderful part of your body. It's got a lot of nerve endings. Let's finish bathing you. Let's finish diapering you, whatever. I mean, that's all they need. They're labeling their world. That's what you're doing, you know, head, shoulder, knees, and toes. You're just helping them label their world. That's two. That's toddlers. There's, there's other things that come at different ages, you know. By the time they're four, they are able to understand what private spaces are. And so even though they've become enamored with this part of their body between two and four, you're saying, you've been saying probably many times along the way, hey, we, when we want to touch that part of our body, we go to our room or to our bathroom because it's a private part of our body. And we want you to feel like you've got the privacy and the safety to touch and enjoy it. When you're done, you can come out, whatever. And we're doing it. And everyone in this family does that. Everyone goes to private spaces, you know, when they want to enjoy that part of their body. Okay. Just learning about beginning to learn social mores, right? We're teaching them all kinds of like, if you're going to pick your nose, don't eat your boogers, right? We're teaching them those social mores around that same age. It's the same stuff, right? Five, oh, no, I should say probably around three or so. They're starting often to say gender oriented kinds of things like daddies do this and mommies do this or I like twirly dresses because they are really pretty or whatever, you know, or I'm a girl. and I mean, they're doing all of these things. And I say to parents, understanding who I feel like on the inside begins to emerge for some kids around age of three. Most of the time it matches what they were born with. And we just go, oh yeah, whatever, right? If it doesn't, we have to listen and encourage them to be themselves. Because if we tell them that who they are isn't okay, they are going to start hating themselves. And kids who have strong personalities can be suicidal by 10. So we've got to say, okay, fine, wear a twirly dress. I don't care. You know, and you want to wear your cowboy boots with that? Fine. Everybody will smile at you at the grocery store because you're pretty cute, right? So we just kind of roll with it. It's really understanding the merging of child development, which is social development, emotional development, physical development with their body curiosities. So also around toddlers, we're teaching about body autonomy. We have to ask if we want to hug somebody. Somebody has to ask you, you know, you get to be in charge of your body. There's a million books on this stuff now. That's really fun. I have a 
six-year-old and three-year-old granddaughters. And when my granddaughter was four, her favorite book was Don't Hug Doug, which was all about Doug doesn't like to be hugged, except for by his mom at nighttime, the only one, you know? And so we're teaching them body autonomy. We're teaching them about what it means to treat others nicely and what it means to be treated nicely. These are all subjects. And so when I put that book together, I was like, here's the behavioral tasks most kids are trying to accomplish in this two-year time frame. Here's the emotional tasks their brain and body is trying to figure out. And here's the sexual or sensual or body curiosities that are also likely to emerge. And then I would ask the parents, what does that feel like for you when you imagine your child doing that? And if you find yourself going, that's just an indicator that you didn't get what you needed at that age, that's okay. Take a deep breath, put your hand over your heart and tell yourself you're good. And let's try to figure out how to heal that. And so I start asking questions like, um, do you have any idea about what, how people talk to you about this side of stuff when you were this age? What would you have liked to have happened? How would you like to feel about it? And then I let them know, this is what your kiddo needs. And here's the top books for kids this age best books for parents and the best websites. And I go all the way through. So I say to parents, you don't have to have it all figured out. You just need to be two years ahead of your kiddo. And I'll help you do that. I'll tell you what books to go buy, websites to look at. Because it isn't the talk. It's 100 one minute conversations throughout their lifetime, like throughout the years that they're growing up until they leave home. And of course they become more complicated and complex as the kid grows up, but it really, it's the merging of where their curiosities in the world are, meet what they need in order to feel equipped to manage the mythology they're going to begin to get by the time they go into kindergarten, first grade, right? And so then when somebody says something, it's not true, they can go, oh, that's not what I heard from my dad's, you know, that's, that's not, that's not right. I'm going to go home and ask about that, you know? So we're equipping them. So when all the entertainment and mythology, fantasy comes to them through their friends, who their friends think this is true, they have, you know, the stuff to be able to think to themselves critically about, well, does that make sense to me? You know, kids are getting exposed to porn around the age of nine. So when we've already talked to them about, you know how sometimes you see things on TV and they're not true, you know, like. We can't climb walls like Spider-Man. Well, there's all kinds of things out there that adults do that are entertainment too. And sometimes it can look like naked people doing things and it might scare you. And if you ever see that and you're just kind of not sure, I'd love to be able to explain that to you, what you saw and help you understand that. Because the world out there is different than our home. Our home's just a little different, you know? So part of my job as your parent is to help protect you and equip you to deal with things that are confusing. It's kind of like that. Little bits along the way. Um, yeah, what's coming up for me is this sort of uh, one element of education that's around making sure they don't get a fundamentally unrealistic and suppressive message. And there's one element of education, which is getting um, age appropriate facts that are empowering. Mm -hmm. There's this other aspect that I'm curious about, which is like the, let's say the art and science of pleasure or something like that. I, I remember going through the Canadian school system in the 90s. And it was pretty good at covering basic anatomy and sexual reproduction. And here's how to put a condom on or tell if somebody's in your personal space. There was no discussion about feeling good whatsoever. There were no pointers on figuring out what we wanted or how do you balance between indulgence and discipline to maximize pleasure or anything like there was no pleasure education whatsoever. Uh, yeah. Do you think something like a hedonic education is necessary to have a population that's capable of enjoying themselves? Or is it something that would like more or less spontaneously emerge if those other problems were taken away? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um in some ways, there's a part of me that says it would spontaneously emerge because it already is. Kids are masters at connection and pleasure. We're hardwired for it. We come out of the womb and we're rooting, seeking the breast. There's no milk there, right? It's about connection and pleasure. Toddlers don't get enough touch and they'll suffer neurological damage. Walk down the halls of an Alzheimer's unit. People don't have memory and they are still seeking 
connection and pleasure. It's one of the hard things for people who are caring for adult people in memory care facilities struggle with, right? Because it's very human. So I do think there that it's emerging. It's it's emerging around us all the time. It's are we there when kids are growing up, are we there to help them understand it? You know, somebody kicks them or is mean to them, they come home. Well, let's talk about that. That's also learning about pleasure, as well as learning about respect and how you take care of each other, how people ought to take care of each other, how you want to be treated, how you don't want to be treated, why you don't want to treat you. There's so many opportunities to talk about power differentials, right? Kids being three, four, five years apart and one who wants something, pleasure, wants something, tries to talk the younger one into it by something that's like not fair, right? This happens in the home all the time. It's a perfect opportunity to be, hey, let's talk about this for a second. If the shoes were on the other foot, would this feel okay to you? Well, no, not really. Okay, I want to explain to you what that is. That's called, you've got more power because you're older. You've been around a while longer. You're also bigger. Your little brother, little sister, cousin, whatever, thinks you walk on water. We call that an abuse of power when you try to get what you want, but it's not fair. And I want you to think about that because I know you want to be treated with respect and treated fairly, but we also have to offer that to others too. And if we use our power to get something and it hurts somebody, then we've actually acted in hurtful ways. And that's not something we value in our family. We value people, which means we treat them the way that we want to be treated. And so we have these opportunities. So then we've already laid the groundwork to talk about how these things have to do in romantic relationships, you know, when they're hitting junior high and whatever, right? And we start to hear, you know, a kid comes home talking about how their friends are talking about girls in disrespectful ways. And it's like, well, let's talk about that. If you were a girl, how do you think that might feel to you? Does that think that would feel okay? Okay, remember what we always say, you know what I mean? So we're talking about these things as they emerge in their life and they are emerging all the time. So it's really about us listening and understanding what's emerging and how this relates to the more complex issue that's going to come up in five years. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. And I think pleasure is an important piece of this, obviously, but it's already there. We just have to know how to build on it. Okay. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I have some um, curiosities around shame too. And I'm, I'm yeah. thinking about sort of two different perspectives. One perspective is shame is pretty much inherently pathological from a social point of view. But the mm -hmm. other point of view is, well, that may be true in some cultures, but we've got this culture and shame is an important part of how we self-organize over time with our traditions. Mm -hmm. Like, Is it valid to say that shame maybe has a more positive role under some cultural circumstances or does it sort of all generically have a pathological effect? Good question. <clears throat> I think this question begs definition because it's a place where we can get confused a lot, understandably, because we don't know exactly what somebody else means when they use the word shame, right? So when I'm talking to somebody and they think it's positive, then I ask them more about it. And often what they're talking about is guilt. Okay. Guilt is when I've done, I have an, an ethic of some kind. I can have an ethic as a five-year-old, but I've got an ethic and I break that ethic. Like I believe maybe at five that telling the truth is really important. And I chose not to. And I feel this feeling in my gut that doesn't feel very good. It's, it's self-regulating. Guilt is self-regulating. It, we know what it is. We have an idea about it. And we know that if we did it different next time, we'd feel better, right? It has an intrinsic motivation attached to it. Shame is when we've gotten in trouble for somebody who we love and who provides life for us, gets mad at us, and we don't know what we've done because whatever it was we just said and did came from a place of absolute innocence that was age appropriate, right? This could be anything from finding your genitals to carrying a glass bottle of milk across the floor and dropping it on accident because it slipped out of our hands and it hit the concrete floor, you know, 
or the slate floor or whatever and went everywhere and somebody lost their mind over it, right? We were just doing our best. <laughs> we were just being who we are at three, at five, at 10, at 15. I call it being your job description. This is why it's so important for parents to understand child development. What are kids trying to do at each age? Because some of the stuff they're trying to do, assert their independence, understand boundaries can be really irritating, right? But that's what they need to do. So when we know, oh, they're fulfilling their job description, then I'm much more likely to be like, dude, yeah, I said no about that. And I said no about that because it's what's best in this moment. And I, you're not supposed to like it. So it's okay you're really mad at me because you want to know what the edges, but I need for you to know that there are edges, you know, because it's not safe for you to have no boundaries at all, right? Whatever. So, um, so I think that when we understand child development, we're much more apt to go, oh, they're just being them and then be more of a parent in that moment as opposed to shaming them, getting really mad at them for being who they are. So shame emerges when we keep when we get in trouble or someone we love gets really mad at us but we're just being who we are and this is why i think in north america that sexual shame is some of our very first shames because from the time we find our genitals until we understand we better not do that in front of anybody there's several years there's anywhere from three to five years of um you know, having a hard time holding that memory or understanding it or having the cognitive structure to understand it. So we've gotten in trouble hundreds and hundreds of times for just being us, you know, and that what shame does is shame makes us feel fundamentally unworthy of love and belonging. Right. And then when it happens around our bodies, that then gets extended to who I am as somebody who wants to connect with somebody else, that's also not good about me, right? And then what happens in, in a culture like America is we start teaching you through media that you're not good enough. Your body's not good enough. You're not skinny enough. You know what we have in the States, we have 50% of six-year-old girls modifying their diets, two-thirds of nine-year-olds, 90% of 15-year-olds. So the culture then lays on top of what parents have already done, and it becomes a feedback loop that be then becomes the internal critic that is going after us all the time by the time we're in our adolescence. You're such a fuck up. You know, you're such a this, you're such a that. You know, you don't look at this. You're not tall enough. You're not this enough. You're not strong enough. You're not... And you're fine, you're beautiful, and you're supposed to be different from all of your friends. Sounds like um, sort of the coherence of sense-making is, is essential to making that distinction between shame and guilt. Like in the shame scenario you're describing, what, what I hear is a demand is being made on you that doesn't make sense in terms of your understanding of yourself and the world, and yet you there's a pressure to adapt to it even though it doesn't make sense. Whereas in guilt, you kind of get what the thing is. You get that there's a, a mismatch between your action and your values, and you might be able to correct that. So, yes, is that right? That's, that is exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so a, a child is more apt to say, I'm not okay. Not what I did and said. Me. Something about me isn't okay. And that's why it sinks in so deep into self-esteem self-value, self-worth. Um, so that means that the uh, applying a developmental lens to this is essential because if a person's ability to make sense of things is changing and growing, mm -hmm. you have to know what that is. Otherwise, you're constantly at risk of breaching that from the outside. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. It, and like I, I've said, it's why ch understanding child development and your own child is so important. And I, I really feel like there's been such a push around capitalism, like <clears throat> get your kid into the right school, put them on the right wait list when they're two years old for the preschool. So they can get into the right elementary school and the junior high and high school and college, and then have that career. I mean, like that's been our focus as opposed to let's really learn about the uniqueness of the human child and your child. And then how do you help them thrive 
as they grow so that they have incredible emotional intelligence, relational intelligence, you know, ability to deal with conflict with people, hold themselves, hold on to themselves in the face of somebody else coming at them or thinking, you know, like give them the confidence that they need to be able to do relationships well. If we focus there, kids are still going to be like passionate about different things and we can help guide them to go to the place that they want to go to make that turn that into a career. I mean, right now you could start your freshman year of college and think you're going to do X and X doesn't exist by the time you graduate. Right. And so we're really needing to build people who have relational and emotional intelligence and skills so that they are adaptable with their creativity and know themselves well enough to know towards those things that they can thrive in and then let those fields keep emerging. Right. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's my direction. I me and music are one. I can go into sound design. I can go into, you know, computers and new sounds. I can do whatever, you know, but I'm going to stay in this direction because that's where I thrive. It's really, I think we've got to change our focus completely. I don't know if I quite have a clear question around this. I've got a vague sense of the role that shamelessness might play in like social activism. As I, obviously, it's very easy for human societies over the course of history to get involved in sort of shame-based patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a role for people to be rebellious against that, to, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we very often think if people get out there and vocalize their values, change will come. And often that doesn't occur. But mm-hmm. every freedom that we have in some ways is downstream of a bunch of people who decided to behave shamelessly in the past and provoked the people around them. What, what do you think the role for shameless public behavior is in like the progressive developing of society and the opening up and breaking through of shame-based patterns? Oh, I love that question. That is such a great question. Ah, I think, I think it comes through when you're having these conversations with children, you're inviting them to think, right? You're engaging in, you're, you're showing that you care about their opinion too. You know, and so they do something that isn't kind or fair. And so you say, so how do you think that might be if, you know, you you have those conversations on the other foot or whatever. And you're all along, you're teaching them that you value their thoughts and opinions and you expect them to think for themselves, to have a kind of, in the in the best sense of the word, a critical kind of thinking, Right. So when they're coming home with their stories from school, you're saying, well, well, what do you think? What do you think would have been the kind thing? What do you think would have been the honest thing? What do you think would have been the just thing to do in that situation? So they grow up learning to examine themselves and their culture and society. They grow up knowing that their parents believe in them to be a change agent, to be an agent of love and justice in the world that other people around them do that in their family, right? So I think it becomes a natural outgrowth of their childhood and adolescence and these kinds of conversations with their parents that they go into the world and they're just following their heart. So where they might uh, act as a change agent, an activist in some way, um, it could be just in the way that they do their job and the way they help people represent themselves in that place. But but it's all a, a very natural outgrowth of how they were treated and how their opinion was respected and challenged as they were growing up. And they just take that into the world in the way that makes sense to them. And so I think then you've got people going out into multiple areas where for them that doesn't feel right or that doesn't look right or that isn't, you know, <clears throat> and I think that's what we want, frankly, you know. Um, is religious shame different from other kinds of shame? Does it have its own special flavor or is it just a, one of many manifestations of the homogeneity of shame? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> I don't know that I entirely know the difference, but, but here's something that it, I think is particular to religious shame. Like, I think a lot of it's the same, very similar. 
But when I was talking earlier about abuse of power, think about the abuse of power when a parent says God thinks or however they call their God, right? God thinks this about that behavior that you did. Now, the child not only worries about how they disappointed the people that they love, but they think that there is a being that is beyond this world that also thinks that about them, right? So it, it clearly adds a whole nother layer. Now, the particulars of the religious doctrine that they're taught are going to have its own flavors on that. So for example, if they're taught they're going to burn in hell, if they are not good, right, or something like that, now they're worried about their eternity. So it has a, a, a big burden on their shoulder, you know, like, I, I don't know how to make this right. And now, not just my human life is at risk. I'll, I'll, I've screwed up, so I'm not going to find a partner. I'm going to have screwed up my future of having a really good relationship. And now I've screwed up my future eternity as well, right? And I have certainly sat with those people who grew up believing that about themselves. So it's a, a whole nother measure, I think, of fear that people carry that adds to this sense of unworthiness because it feels even that much bigger, their, their, their humanity, actually. I mean, their, what they would say is their sins or whatever. Yeah. What, um, I don't know if you have an opinion about this, but what does it do to religion to set it free from shame and help it to integrate intimacy? What sort of religion might you get under those conditions? But that's also a great question. I love that question. I, well, what is religion? I mean, you know, in patriarchy, religion is to control, um, control and have power over people. It's about power and control. It's basically what patriarchy is, right? But fundamentally, when you look at so many of the world faith traditions, inside is supposed to be about love and justice, right? What does it mean to love and be loved? What does it mean to be just? And to be a person of justice, you know, mutuality, you know, I think at the core of many world religions, that's what's there at, at the core of it. It's just that when, when we institutionalize it and we put it inside the context of patriarchy, which is what we've done, then it becomes about those in power trying to manip manipulate those who are not in power to their benefit. And it becomes actually the opposite of love and justice, which is such an irony. But man, we've got plenty of written history to show this in m many, if not most of the world religions, once it became institutionalized. And, and in Christianity, that was the fourth century. So there were almost 400 years of, people just going around and telling people about Jesus and how to, you know, try to live in community and I don't know, all the things, right? And they were all, of course, being persecuted and all that. And then in the fourth century, Constantine, who was an emperor, he had the power, he becomes a quote unquote Christian. He then can begin to appoint people to be the leaders of this new church. Because men were the only ones vying for those positions or the only ones being considered and at that particular time in the fourth century, they were showing how they were more spiritual than each other by denying the body and the body pleasures and body's desires. That didn't have anything to do with Jesus or Jesus ministry. Nothing at all. Zippo, zero. It had everything to do with, look at me, look at me. I'm better than this person over here. And that became the sexual ethic of the Christian church. And when men couldn't deny their pleasures, their desires, they blamed women. Well, she was to this or she was to that or she was wearing this or that, right? Same stuff we see today, right? Christianity at its core does not hold men accountable for what they say and do, especially around their sexual desires, right? So we've been building a patriarchal system that's about power and control 
we call it Christianity in all its different forms. It's just another expression of patriarchy. It's a slippery topic, patriarchy, but there's, it is. there's a pattern. There's a pattern you're describing. And that pattern goes back thousands of years before Christianity as well. Yes, and it presumably does. Presumably it might have occurred intermittently in the whatever, 10 to 200,000 years of pre-recorded history of human beings. Uh, but also we associate that sort of archaic mode of living with a more uh, naturalistic sensibility. I'm curious uh, how you, and we, we don't really know how these things began, but how do you imagine the, the trends that lead to patriarchy beginning? What, what's your sort of personal story of the ancient origins of this? Yeah, and I am not an expert at this, but from what I've read and understand, it had to do with agriculture. When we were foraging, when we were a foraging people, which we were for tens of thousands of years, roles were also clearly defined, right? And so the men of the tribe or the village, whatever, not village, tribe, I guess, they would be going out to try and find often meat. And this took very particular skills, very focused skills, and they were gone home back at where they were at that moment in their movement were the women who were planting and caring for children. So they were providing actually the bulk of the food, but it was all plant-based food and they were caring for the children and doing what they could to protect each other. And the men would go and come back and bring things. And so when they would have their, I don't even know what they were called circles to make decisions for the tribe, the circles always involved women and men because the men knew they needed the women and the women knew they needed the men. They may not have liked it. You know, there may have been differences, all of that, but they absolutely needed to have each other at the decision table, if you will. As soon as we began cult staying in one place and cultivating that land, we began creating hierarchies of power. And that's, where patriarchy seemed to get a real footing. Um, and I couldn't tell you exactly what year that was, but there is enough written history to sort of be able to, you know, these chiefdoms, I think, is what started to rise up out of staying in one place and cultivating the land. So that's what I know. That's all I know. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's flip from the past to the future. There's been, uh, some years now of uh, sort of uh, well, some kind of social advance, uh, which feminism has been a big piece. <laughs> um, yeah. Where do you see it going in the future? What do you think are the most important goals for a healthy mm -hmm. feminism over the next couple of decades, say? Well, there's a, a, a couple of good books that I read in 2019. And one of them is called um, Women After All by Melvin Connor. And he's a medical anthropologist, brilliant human. And it's a really, really good book. I read it twice through and it's just filled with research. So it's looking at sort of macro mammal development all the way to social development to where are we today? And, um, and he really sees that there's a bend occurring in patriarchy and whether it will end or balance out to something different before we kill ourselves in the planet, I don't know. Um, but I did finish that book feeling hopeful, not for myself, but for my granddaughters, hoping. But I do think it's a race. I, I think that we know a couple of things. We know when we give women reproductive rights and education, just those two things, that every other measure of social success, social thriving improves business, investment, finances, healthcare, education, all just all measures of a society improve when you make those things available to women because women are pretty industrious by and large. Women are also not the ones who start wars by and large and not the ones that rape or do sexual violence by and large. So as we move the pendulum towards a place where more women are in places of leadership over societies and cultures, 
we're going to start to see an increase in financial stability, educational stability, healthcare, emotional stability of people, etc. And a decrease in reactive reactivity and and um, sexual exploitation. And that movement, you know, and I'm not going to call it something different, I'll call it something other than patriarchy, that movement out of that is going to create more health and wellness all the way along the way. The thing that I think makes me the saddest is that while men, you know, under patriarchy experience some benefits to that, right? There's so much that being compromised for them in their own lives and their own happiness because of patriarchy, right? Just, just being raised to have your range of emotions, just being raised for somebody to be curious, well, what are, how are you different from your brother or this person? I mean, who are you? What's the range of you? And how do you live in that range of you? You know, there's so much liberation that, that is denied under patriarchy for our boys and not just our girls. And, 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 then, and then people across the spectrum of beauty in gender and beauty in relationship structures and all of that kind of thing. There's just so, there's so much more um, diversity and beauty to be celebrated and enjoyed and appreciated, I think, under a system that is not a system of patriarchy. Um, we have forgotten how we need the land, right? We're still, you know, trying to build more cities and whatever. And our earth is crying. And I, I really think that we are on, it's like cancer. And I worked in oncology for a decade. I don't know who's going to win here. Can't the cancer of patriarchy and how it's destroying us and destroying our land and whatever, or if our own love and resilience will will beat it out and, and then create a tipping point at some point where we start to heal, right? Heal our land, heal our peoples, talk about how do we live in community better and whatever. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but it worries me. And I, I have ki- I have four kids in their thirties and, um, Right now, only one of them chose to have children. And we'll see what the other ones decide. But um, I listen to a lot of 30-somethings and 20-somethings. They're really worried. Yeah, there's a lot about the um, what we're calling the patriarchy that has not been great for men emotionally, physically. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about a masculinity crisis in our societies now, uh, mm-hmm. particularly exacerbated by lives built around digital tools. Mm-hmm. Uh, what yeah. do you think? What do you think young men need right now? Well, I think they need to be in the woods. <laughs> I think they need to be creating. You know, I think they need to be thinking. I think the digi- digital stuff needs to be, in some ways, turned off and find out who you are. Who are you? Not not who are you told to be through media, but who are you? What are you curious about? You know, get them back creating and um, hunting and fishing and playing together and listening to each other. But with some of this, this uh, permission to be the breadth of who they are, right? Um, and I think a lot of that is moving them out of the city stuff and out into the woods out where they can create and build and play 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 i think kids have in i think we all do actually have an intrinsic wisdom about what is good for us and good for each other and i think we have to get out of um out of our media soaked society to actually listen to that small, still voice that tells us what sounds like it will be fun to do, you know? And as somebody who lives in the Pacific Northwest and somebody who grew up hunting and fishing and camping and whatever, and all my kids are are still into that, 
I watch how that continues to happen, you know, with children that they, they know how to play. They know how to make up games if they're in the woods together, you know, let them do that. And then let that teach us what they need to cultivate health and wellness, you know, um, and get them away from the TVs and the digital stuff. And not that that doesn't might not have a place in our future, but let that be way later, you know, later adolescence, college, even to be like, okay, now that you know these things about you and who you are and what your passions are, and what it means to treat people well. Now here's some tools, some more tools. What can you do with those tools to make living better for people? I feel like play as well as the right kind of um, feedback and context socially from people around yeah. you is yeah. an essential driver of the of healthy development between these different age phases you were talking about. And I'm curious how you think about the possibility of ongoing developments, you know, after you've reached adulthood, um, do you think, mm, what's your sense of how far a human being could continue to mature if they continue to have good feedback, continue to have good play, continue to sort of seek and grow and be challenged? Yeah, I think that the continued growth then happens most often in the context of community. Right. So I grow, I decide to be a parent, let's say, wow, that teaches me so much about myself and how I need to grow and how I do and don't have patience and just so many things because they're growing and becoming their own person. They're not being who I decide they get to be. They're being who they are. And that might push on me anyway. So that helps me to grow. I'm in community in a way that I have people in my community who challenge me, who offer new ideas and whatever. And that challenges me and I keep growing there. It requires though, the, the degree to which I'm going to do that well and keep growing, keep evolving is predicated on how secure I feel as a person to then look at those places that still need to grow versus be reactive, blame, throw up walls, you know, put someone down, what all the things that I can do as an adult person to keep myself from growing, but also defend myself, right? So if I'm going to keep growing, and I think a lot of people don't, frankly, a lot of people are in 60 year old bodies, and they're still 17, or five, or whatever, right? But if we're going to keep growing, I've got to know how to hold on to myself and say, yeah, of course you've got places to grow. That's not bad about you. It's part of being human. I've got to be able to do that in order to respond to the invitation to grow, I think. But I think it happens in community, whether it's our home community, our, relation, our neighborhood community, whatever communities we're involved in. We talked a little bit about religion, but there's this other, maybe we want to call it spirituality or something like that. Mm -hmm. And its interrelationships with sexuality are very interesting. All right. There's a lot of people who pursue a tantric path or there's yeah. sex magic or there's just sort of a casual way of trying to induce peak experiences through sexual communion and things like that. What's your sense of some of the more, you know, interesting, far out psychological possibilities that are available to us uh, spiritually through sexuality? Yeah. Oh, you've got some good questions. This is so fun for me. <laughs> I love good questions. This is a good one. I actually think that there have been those things and uh, ancient things like Tantra and other, and, and I've studied Tantra and I, it's, there's some wonderful things. There's what Tantra taught me is that you can heal people through loving sexual touch more effectively than you can do it in talk therapy if part of their wounding is around sexuality, which most people have wounding around sexuality. And I, I was never taught that. I mean, I was a therapist. I went to school forever. I have all these degrees. I was never taught that about sexuality. I saw it happen in tantric retreats with people who had huge wounds in their relationships and in their lives. And then I watched how over two, three, four days, it was mind blowing to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm seeing something I was never taught. And so I, you know, did more study about it. So Tantra 
is, is does, uh, I think if there's a merging of the bio, psycho, social, spiritual, sexual that happens in something like Tantra that we just have a hard time accessing in other forms of healing modalities. But we are on the precipice of one that is going to blow the top off of mental health care. And that is psychedelic assisted therapy. So right now in the United States, ketamine is legal for use with depression and anxiety and, you know, other PTSD, whatnot. Sometime in 2024, the FDA is likely to approve MDMA because it's already been through phase three trials. Its results are unbelievable. You know, more than 60% of the people never have or haven't in more than a year have any symptoms of PTSD or complex PTSD after having it in severe ways for 20 plus years, right? We have nothing like this. And it's not, a, it's not about symptoms, the symptoms of PTSD or trauma or depression or anxiety or all that. It's about allowing the brain to open up like it does pre, like when you're one, two, three, four, and five, your brain isn't thinking in patterns. It's thinking, it's going wherever it makes sense. It just goes, right? But as we get older, our brain locks into patterns based on our experiences. And it has a hard time thinking anything different, right? Like I was talking about that internal critic that gets going. That's a brain patterning, right? Psychedelics, and there's different psychedelics act differently, but, but they all, generally speaking, allow the brain to open up and go to new places such that people have different experiences under the medicine that heal and challenge and give them new perspectives about things. And so they come out, they might have gone into the medicine thinking, I have never deserved love. I have never gotten love. No one out there can be trusted to love. And that's my life. And they come out of the medicine saying, oh, I understand why my mom was the way she was with me. And it didn't have to do with the fact that I wasn't loving. She just had her hurt and limitations. I do deserve love. And I can love. And I can receive love. And they go home and start receiving love from a partner they haven't received love from yet. Right. I mean, really revolutionary changes. So it's going to be the wild, wild west over the next decade as we try to build the regulations in. We try to make the medicines accessible. We have a horrible healthcare system in the United States that is absolutely falling apart. And we've known this for 25 years. But and, and the way it's going to come out initially is these treatments are going to be anywhere from. $3,500 to $20,000, right? No insurance coverage in the United States for these things. So it's not going to be accessible to the people who need it most. The kind of trauma we have in the United States is off the charts, but we're going to have to work to figure out ways to make it accessible to the people who need it most, as well as how to do it in a way that's non-colonizing, right? A lot of these plant-based medicines have been cared for by indigenous people for thousands of years. The last thing we need to do is cause more pain there. So we're going to need to deliver this care in a way that honors those people and those lands. So it's going to, it's going to be a rocky road over the next decade, but the opportunity here to help people heal trauma and heal these mental um, health conditions that leave them living a very tiny life, liberate them to actually be able to see themselves as valuable, love, ask themselves what they're passionate about, go out and make a difference in the world. I mean, it's, it's really going to be revolutionary. The hardest thing is going to be how do we keep it from being colonized and capitalized in such a way that it becomes only for the worried wealthy. If we do that, that will be a shame. But let me tell you, there'll be an underground where people will be trying to find a way to get it out to people to heal people. That's just going to happen because there are far too many people that I have met because I'm trained in this that want this to go well and really want it to make a difference because we also see it as a possibility of helping to heal the earth and make some shifts and changes that need to happen socially for us, right? If we're going to, if we're going to make it, if the earth's going to make it, it's our earth is finite. It's an organism. 
cannot keep torturing it forever and expect it to keep providing food and water for you. Got a question and maybe it's my last question. Um, <laughs> and I don't know if there's an answer, but what is intimacy and what is it about these more flexible, generalized childlike learning states induced by psychedelics that allows the brain to find the thread of intimacy that leads it out of trauma? Well, again, I think the intimacy, that initial question, I think that's innate. I think there's an inner healer inside all of us. There's an inner wisdom inside all of us that wants connection and pleasure and safety and thriving. That's just there, right? And so when psychedelics help to open a space for the body mind to move toward that in a way that then it can begin dealing with some of the challenges and the darkness and the fears uh, that are inside of that, right? And and then emerge on the other side in a slightly different place, or maybe even a significantly different place. Now they might do this several times over the course of, of years. And each time they get a little freer and a little freer and a little freer, because that's the natural state of the of the body mind, of the inner wisdom, is to live in a way that you thrive. Right. I think our body mind healer and what we're learning in in sort of the the neurobiologies and the the inter more integrated medicines that are emerging now is that that way in which the body mind heals itself is not different than the way the body tries to heal itself that that inner wisdom is there you cut yourself cover it up you clean it protect it and the body does the rest so all we're doing here is providing what the body needs in order to free itself, to heal itself, because that's what it wants to do. That's its natural state, right? So I don't think we have to do a lot in that. I think we just need to free, provide the the place for it to so heal. These, these enriched, the, the regeneration of these enriched learning modes allows us to renormalize, and it's normal for us to orient along intimacy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Intimacy in my mind is the desire to be seen, known, loved, accepted. We want that our whole lives. And we go as humans, we go about it in many, many ways. That's the beauty of our diversity, right? But it's what we're seeking. We're seeking to be seen, known, loved, and accepted. And, and that feels well, lovely to us because we're designed for connection and pleasure. And so, and our children show us that from the get-go. And that's still who we are. We get talked out of things. I, I was doing a human design reading recently and, and the person I was talking to, she said, your inner, your inner wisdom is like a, a self-driving car's GPS. It knows where to go. The mind, however, needs to be a passenger. It's a great thing. Your mind is a great thing. Your brain is a great thing. All of that. But it needs to be a passenger, not the driver, because it often doesn't know where to go. It understands lots of things, but it ought not be the driver, because when our brain does the driving, then it's also the mythology we've been picking up, all the socialization we've been picking up, a lot of things that, in fact, are not in our best interest, right? And so it's being able to recognize the mind, listen to it, watch it, but not put it in the driver's seat. But listen to that inner wisdom, that inner knowing that we have from the time we're little, right? And let that remain in the driver's seat. Beautiful. This has been, uh, this has been lovely connecting with you. Yeah, you as well. Wonderful questions. Really fun conversation. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. Thanks, Tina. I appreciate this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.